and welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Justin Lee. Now, Justin Lee is a fellow sales trainer, so he can work under pressure and he knows what a good elevator pitch is. So I'm going to get to introduce himself. Justin, welcome and please introduce yourself. Fred, thanks for having me. <laughs> so uh, I'd, I'd be delighted to introduce myself. My name is Justin Lee. I am the founder of Focus for Growth. We're a sales and leadership training company, and we specialize in the dental and medical markets. I am the best-selling author of the business book, Inspire, Influence, Sell, and I work with some of the leading companies in dental and medical spaces. And uh, the company that uh, we work for, Focus for Growth, our vision is about bringing, bringing world-class best practice to our clients in that dental and medical space. Brilliant. Nicely done, sir. Thank you. World class. <laughs> well, I expect nothing less. <laughs> no, but but world class best practice. I mean, you're focusing specifically on dental medical, but world yeah. class best practice for them will be the same for, for many other, every mm. other salesperson, really. Yes. Um, yeah. So, and, and absolutely, Fred. And I've worked across lots of different industries, but where I've always, I guess, felt I've had the biggest impact is in those dental and medical markets where you're kind of dealing with patients where you know healthcare practitioners are really making a difference to the people that they're treating uh, and so it's just it's uh, personally it's a bit of a passion of mine to work in those uh, in those marketplaces with those customers cool cool mm. cool, cool right so let, let's tap into some of this world-class best practice yes um, please do yeah the framework we'll use uh, as, as per normal on this, this this podcast is to go through the elements of pq yeah um so you know take things from the book take things that you're working with sales teams and just let's think about you know how we can help people with some of these elements mm. um so let's, let's kick off with trust i always kick off with trust because for me it's foundational to, to, to yeah. good selling um so you know what would you say about trust and how how sales people can really develop that with customers mm. so it's interesting what the i in the models that i use uh, fred and you, you'll know this because i know you've read my book uh, uh -huh. well, maybe like more it. than once fred maybe more than once <laughs> uh, but it has pen of... marks in it which is a good sign mate <laughs> good, good thank you not crossings uh, but, out <laughs> I, I, yeah don't, why did he say that uh, wrong <laughs> but i have um i have this model called inspire and the, the inspire model is is like a one it's a mnemonic but it's also a cycle and at the center of the cycle is rapport and relationships and that really is all about trust and I look at trust, rapport and relationships through, the, through a kind of couple of lenses. The first lens is the relationships that we have to establish that are long term, loyal client relationships. And there are lots of things we can do to establish loyalty, establish trust. But there's, there's a couple of things in particular. The, fir the first is I've always, since I became conscious of how important trust is in relationships, I've always thought about taking the position that I give trust to somebody else, first and foremost, upfront, 100%, and it's theirs to break, right? So nobody has to earn my trust. I give it freely from the outset. Right? And that, that puts me in a really strong position from the start of any relationship because I, I, I not only deliver trust, but you can sense it. You can sense that I trust people very quickly, very early. And it's only when they break it that I'll then start to back away from that. But counter to that, Whenever I'm establishing trust with somebody, I start from the basis that I have to earn it from, from zero, right? So it's my job in a relationship to give trust completely, but take the perspective that the other person needs me to earn it from, you know, from a baseline of zero. And, and just that perspective, just thinking about the relationship with somebody else like that establishes a really deep and kind of uh, authentic uh, basis for trust. So, that, so that's established relationships. And, and you'll be familiar, Fred, with the emotional bank account principle, right? Mm -hmm. So recognizing that what establishes trust, what strengthens trust and relationships over time are the deposits that we make in the relationship with somebody else. And recognizing that if at any point we make a withdrawal from that relationship, we just need to, to make a sense check around the balance. Where are we with this relationship? Have I asked for too much from the client, the partner, the peer, the team member, um, a family member, a friend? If I'm continually drawing from that relationship and never depositing, I'm pretty soon at some point that person's gonna either lose trust in me 
or or stop engaging or withdraw themselves. So we have to see that equilibrium in the relationship. We have to make deposits, and those deposits can be things like praise, recognition, listening, uh, thinking of that person, sending them something that uh, that is interesting. Maybe it's an insight. Maybe it's that something we've learned. And we think actually that would be relevant for this client of mine, and sending that freely. You know, some some of these things that we have we should do to really strengthen their relationship on an ongoing basis. And then the second part for me is how do you form fast relationship with new people? And I've already talked about, you know, my perspective going in, which is I've got to earn your trust, but you've got mine from the outset. The, the second principle is around how you develop rapport. And there's lots of ways to develop rapport. But one of the most effective ways to develop rapport is one to have that mindset in, in you know yourself going in which i've already talked about but the second is to get in, intensely curious about the other person because rapport is formed when we are either if we find ourselves similar to the other person we think we're the same right but we can't always guarantee that or when we feel like the other person is genuinely interested in us and they are the two most effective ways to build rapport. So you've got, you know, trust and relationships is so important, but it's actually quite a complex topic as well. So you can't just go, oh, well, I build trust really quickly and easily. Actually, you should be intentional about it. And you should have a, a, a series of principles that you follow that enable you to do it consistently over time. There you go. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that, that is absolutely bang on, mate. No, really, really like it. It's intentional. It's the series of principles. And it's, it's just way deeper than, oh, go and try and be somebody's friend. Yes. You know, we, we know salespeople are like, oh, I've got to be their best friend forever, you know, looking for invites to the wedding and all this. No, there, there's different things. And, and some people might listen to this and go, well, doing that stuff you said, isn't that a bit manipulative then? How, how would you count that argument? So I don't, mm. well, would you count that? I don't believe it is, but what do you think? No, I, I would, I'd, I'd use the term intentional rather than manipulative uh, and and if somebody sees it as manipulative um you know think about where we where i started that and i started that by saying you have my complete trust from the outset and i accept i have to earn yours there's nothing that in fact that's the reverse of manipulative you could argue that opened you up to being manipulated if you're not careful yes you yeah. do you have to take an approach that is you know um, authentic genuine but also one where you are looking for the cues, uh, you know, ensuring that you look have the best interest of your company and your customer at the same time. And, and that's that's the other balance. We see salespeople who sometimes can feel a little bit overcommitted to customers. They can't, they, they struggle to have that difficult conversation. They say yes to everything that the customer requests. Well, when you think about a trusting partnership relationship, and I know you know, your model is all about partnership. It's absolutely bang on. But if it, if it is a true partnership, yes, we have to establish trust and relationships, but we should also feel strong enough in that relationship to say, I'm sorry, I don't think that's appropriate. Or actually, at this stage, I can't give you that, but let's talk about how we might get to that in the future. What I'm going to need to see between now and then is this, this, and this. So you, you have the strength of character because you know you're doing things in the right way where you're not manipulating the relationship at all in fact you're standing your ground but you're also being fair and equitable to the customer brilliant uh, yeah say so it's intent isn't it that's what you said you're yeah. doing it with good intent you are the one who's being bothered to make the shifts to mm. put yourself out there absolutely because ultimately we want to be establishing this win-win relationship yeah. And then let's move on to that because you're already mm. talking about it, actually. Um, so, yeah, keep, keep, keep talking about the kind of this win win focus that yeah. you know, somebody who's good at this stuff will have. Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I heard um, a podcast recently. Uh, it was it was a mind, it was a Mind Valley Superhumans at Work podcast. It was a guy who, who articulated this really well. I can't remember his name, but um, I could look it up. But he talked about the ability to influence. Okay, and he said that true influence is only achieved when I listen to what you want, and I truly understand what you want. I, we both agree that that's what you want, right? OK, and then once I understand what you want, I'm confident to say, well, here's what I want as well. And between the two of us, two parties in the relationship, we then discuss and decide and agree 
how we are going to find a way to both get what we want so that it's a win for you and it's a win for me. And that is when real influence occurs because I want to be influenced. If, if you and I, Fred, agree that we were going to work on something together and you agree what you want from that working relationship or from that um, you know, partnership, and I agree the same, and we both say, actually, neither one of us is only going to put our own interests at heart. We are going to ensure that we both meet our needs. We both get what we're looking for out of this relationship. Why wouldn't you go all in on that? You know, so the win-win is, is is more than just a term or a, or a flippant saying. It's, it's absolutely fundamental to both parties being highly motivated to deliver on their commitments and deliver the outcome that meets both parties' needs. Love that. No, that I love that definition of true influence. Good, isn't it? No, no, it is excellent. You're going to have to send a link to that podcast. I want to listen to that. I will. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Need to get this guy on. Um, no, but no, yeah. I, I, no, no, I love what you're saying because, you know, th these elements of PQ, they all come together. And we talk about them one by one, but of course they, they all kind of... Um, overlap. Yeah, they, they do, do overlap because mm. now you're moving into the next one. This is great. Easiest podcast interview ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> because you're talking about interdependence. We become interdependent. You know, my yeah. success is going to be linked to your success, vice versa. Yeah. So again, you know, what what things can we do deliberately, do intentionally to make sure that's happening? Mm. I, I would say it's it, so it starts with the, the objectives that you set the outcome that you set start with you know start with the end in mind and if your if your end point is thinking about you know those components of pq and interdependency declaring that with your customer or partners understanding what they are looking for and just making sure that at all times you remind yourself that this is about the collaboration it's about meeting both parties goals and if ever you find yourself doing what is human nature right which is to think about our own selfish goals you know it's human nature right we're fighting human nature when we're not acting that way um so we have to we have to remind ourselves actually this is about a collaboration it's about meeting both parties needs it is about this interdependence and when you when you can get to the point where that becomes almost your default in terms of the thinking. I think that's when you really, you reach your breakthrough moments. You, you are able to, without, without having to force it, you're continually looking for that opportunity. You know, the intersection between what I want and what you want is what we both want. And that's what drives and motivates our behavior. So I think it has to become a way of thinking, but in the early stages, if you're not used to doing it. And I remember this, you know, earlier in my career when I was first in sales, yeah. it took quite a shift in my own thinking to get to that point. Uh, I had, and I and, it, and I kept finding myself going back to the default, which was, you know, I need to hit my sales targets. I need to deliver on this number. And to, to get beyond that takes a lot of self-discipline, a lot of courage sometimes because your number doesn't go away. You, you know, the, the, the sales target, we're, we're all in sales, right? But, when we're in sales, we have sales targets to hit. So sometimes just to say, well, meet your customer's needs alongside and at times over and above your own, and then the business will come. That's a bold thing to do because early on, I'm like, yeah, but what about my number? I've got to hit this, this many you know, key metrics in the business. I've got this sales target to meet. I've got these activity targets to hit. I've got these key accounts to, to, you know, to infiltrate and and influence and so we we get in our own heads without realizing it but the the shortcut to success is to bypass our own needs meet our customers needs above our own mm -hmm. think about that collaboration and that interdependency and that's when you will you make the shift and break through no it is no it, it is bold thinking Mm. Yeah, and you know this is this is why i champion this is why i want to talk about it because you know you know as well it does make a difference yeah, it, it kind of seems counterintuitive if you're not thought about this deeply enough it's like i'm out to make my sounds do this and you know kind of the all 80s greed is good type stuff <laughs> it, it doesn't work no. it does not work you know and this way of thinking does mm. but we've got to get we've got to try to help people to understand this yeah it's these conversations and, and trying yeah. to try to share and i think um, i think you've got to you know you've got to because you could be talking to sales and business development professionals, right? 
we've got to get you've got to make sure that everybody through the organization understands it because if as a salesperson i'm working in, in an organization i want to take that approach but i don't have that support from my sales leader that makes it really difficult all of a sudden i've got this conflict i've got a conflict of you know wanting to hit my number pressure from people in you know management positions and then pressure to perform in front of a client where i know actually what i should be doing is taking a partnership approach but the pressure from you know internally in the company is about hitting numbers they don't see that bigger picture it's about educating all parties involved isn't it yeah, totally i mean you've heard me go on and on haven't you about the muddled mindset thing which yeah. we sales people have in that you know we can help them they'll think like this they probably do get it and the organization says yeah we work consultatively that's how we operate you know customers needs at heart till the 28th of the month all right get out there <laughs> Yeah. Plug some stuff. Well, yeah. But that's just the opposite of what we said that we do. And then that just repeats and repeats. Actually, we don't really do this original thing. We might as well just carry on doing this all month because that's what you're going to ask me to do anyway. Yeah. Month, that's quarter, year Well, end. yeah, but insert own date, but it kind of happens. Yeah. <laughs> you just crank them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and again, let's move on because the, 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 the another element is, is what I'm tending to call transparency now. Um, but in the original model, what Steve Dent talked about was self-disclosure and feedback. And again, yeah. you are already touching on this. You know, you've got mm. to give a bit of yourself. You've got to be saying, this is what I need. This is, these are my expectations. Mm. And you've got to be saying to the customer, and this is what we said we do, but you're not doing your part. So again, I'd love mm. your thoughts around that and you know, how, we can, mm. how we can do that. Because it's, it's easy said, you know, there you go, consensus, like explain what you need to do. But how in real life do we do that? Mm. Yeah, well... It's interesting. I, I like the term transparency. Um, I, so when I when I look at sales, uh, and it took me a long time to figure this out, uh, I, I think about three elements. So I, I think about not only the model and the structure. That's, for me, that's the last piece of the puzzle, right? The first part of the puzzle is mindset and psychology and feeling in myself as if I deserve to be in front of the customer, as if I have earned my place you know, at the table, as if I know enough about the marketplace, I know enough about my own portfolio, I know enough about the customer, I know enough about my own capability, and I can bring all of that together so that when I'm sitting in a meeting with a customer, I feel worthy to be in the room. And that sounds like a really simple thing. You go, yeah, well, why wouldn't you? Uh, well, those of us who have been in sales and we've been in, you know, those key critical, big, moment meetings and all of a sudden the, the, the little voice in your head goes oh my god this is big <laughs> and you're like oh don't mess it up right working up to that moment having the confidence in those situations to declare actually you know for this deal to be right for both parties i need to state our intent or i need to state our position or i need to talk to you about what we need that takes courage, right? And, and it also takes, if you don't come from a place of genuine influence, I want you to get what you need so that we can also get what we need. If you don't come from that place, if you can't articulate that, then the customer reads it as you're being selfish, right? You're not actually trying to get a win-win here. And so you've got mindset on one uh, on one hand, which is I manage myself, I feel confident to make the request. I'm coming from a place where I already thought about my true intent, and that is one of mutual success, right? That's mindset first. Second is then the skill to be able to communicate it in a way where the customer's on board and they feel like you have listened. You've been able to you know, really truly understand what they need. You've asked good questions, you've listened. You've joined up the dots for the customer. You've been able to articulate why your business is a better choice for the customer and that partnership than anyone else in the market. You're able to, you know, weave in different stories of, of other successful customers. You've, you're in a position where actually you've sensed and read the situation. You feel like there is an opportunity there that's right for you and the customer. And at that point, you would then declare you know, this is what we believe a fair deal looks like for both parties. Because if you do it any sooner than that, or if you haven't, if you haven't got the confidence and the authenticity, and you haven't got the right skills to communicate it effectively, and you haven't followed then a structure, 
you know, whether that's a sales cycle, sales process, whatever it is that you use. If you haven't got those building blocks in place, you're going to find that in those difficult situations, you're either going to choke and you won't get the real deal that you need, or that the customer's going to think this doesn't send, this doesn't feel right to me. There's something not quite right about this, and you'll lose the deal, right? Or, or you end up compromising on what you need and the customer gets probably too good a deal and your organization then struggles to, to deliver the true experience that the customer needs so for me that that is all about it's, it's not a simple you know there's no silver bullets right it's about thinking about what is it that really makes up our ability to to, to be in those situations with confidence and handle it it's, it's not one thing it's a number of different components love it and, and i like the way you're talking about choking you know which is, which is a sports term isn't it yes you know yeah. and then and, and sports professionals will do everything they possibly can not to do that yeah and that isn't just well i'll just rock up and play the round of golf without any practice or mm. yeah we don't need a plan for this game we'll just run around and kick the ball a little bit and see what happens no they work to structure and they practice the structure and they're expert yeah. in that structure they know what they're doing when they're doing why they're doing it Yet it still happens to them, people mm. who are the very best at what they do. Yeah. So if you've not got any structure or do whatever, the likelihood is just way, way higher, isn't it? Way yeah, higher. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. practice in private, right? Practice in private, deliver in front of the client, practice in private. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so many times you hear people say, I can't stand role plays. Um, and I, I get that from earlier in my career where it felt really uncomfortable. Well, do you want to feel uncomfortable in a, in a training room? where you're practicing in a safe environment or do you want to feel uncomfortable in front of a customer when you when you're in the middle of a big deal and you're thinking god where do i go next always you know always try and make the the skills the structure the approach the mindset if you can make that as automatic as possible so that you've yes. practiced it so much that whether you are in you know a, a, a straightforward comfortable customer conversation or you're in front of a, a board of, a, of directors of, of your largest client delivering a presentation on how you think you can help them and, and you know using that as a sales conversation vehicle uh, and still feeling equally as confident you know, how, how do you make sure that you manage yourself the way that you approach that situation and the structure that you use so that it delivers time and time again regardless of the pressure and the intensity that that takes practice yeah and that's why the top performers can do what they do again you go back mm. to sport why because we've done it before you know yeah. i i hate that whole thing oh you can't practice penalties you can practice all the elements apart from yeah the crowd and that particular moment but mechanics and the knowing where to kick it and how to do it and all that sort of thing yes you absolutely can and so yeah. same for sales i've been in a situation before yes it was a practice but it's better than being in the situation and I have no idea what to do here now. Yeah, I've now got to try and manage the situation and make up the stuff that I've got to do here mm. with nothing to fall back on. So, mm. but then that depends on the quality of the role play. That's a different podcast, mate. It's totally different. <laughs> 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 we could talk for hours just on how to make that work. But yeah, um, yeah. I, do you know? I remember uh, when I was um, sales manager in Three uh, and Medical, and we ran. I was working with the HR director at the time. We we created a um an assessment process for new hires and it took it took i mean we worked on it for months right but we set out all the different and we we got people role playing as part of that onboarding uh, well no uh, recruitment process it wasn't even onboarding it's part of the recruitment process yeah. so we had a full assessment day and one of the key uh, elements that we were measuring was that salesperson's ability to sell in you know in in a i guess it was a, fa a false environment but it was a created customer environment that we just wanted to see right this is the customer's going to say this how do they handle that how do they handle key objections are they asking good questions and you know we would brief uh, some of our so our, some of our either our sales managers or other members of the team would come in and play the customer and we would say you know here are the things that you can divulge but you only divulge them if you're asked the question and it'd be yeah. really really interesting to see highly experienced sales professionals come into those interview situations that assessment that uh, uh, process we'd brief them you give them half an hour to prepare and they'd come in and just pitch the pitch on a product they'd never sold and actually all we wanted to see was are you are you able to take a sales-led approach which is you know consultative selling asking really good questions connecting with the customer building rapport gaining trust 
getting their understanding of what they really need and then starting to join up some dots for the customer. And actually, all we needed to, them to get to was a stage where the customer was interested, would agree to at least look at the product and try it. And we had people coming in trying to <laughs> convert on the first meeting. doesn't happen. Yeah. Right? It doesn't yeah. happen in that environment. So, yes. Yeah, can I predict what happened next? Which is when that was pointed out to them, they went, yeah, but it wasn't real anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Was that, that what happened? Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Much, that's what people do. So we try we, to make it as real as possible. We took a coaching-led approach. So yeah. we, would, we would self, we would coach them after those sessions, interact. Yeah. How do you think, how do you think that meeting went? Okay. What, what was the outcome that you set? Okay. How well did you perform against the outcome? What would you change if you could go back and do it again? What did you think happened at this stage of the meeting? And sometimes people were completely unaware. It just zero went. I think it went really well. <laughs> we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we <ask the> <laughs> so it was, it was, yes, it just depends. Yeah. I think it really does depend on your style and, the type yeah. of training that you've had, um, the approach that you take, uh, and whether or not you are you are following, you know, whether or not that's an intentional approach, or whether you're, you know, winging it and, yeah. and just kind of doing what you think is is the right right thing to do. Because the, the stats are quite uh, interesting, Fred. I don't know if you've seen this, but the evidence shows that fifty five percent of people working in sales professional roles b2b sales professional roles 55 percent have never been through a sales training program they've been trained on the company's products they've mm. been trained on the market on the customers never been trained to sell and and work through a sales process so a lot of people and I, you know i was like first i didn't have sales training until i was three years into to sales i've been selling for three years before before someone trained me and i remember the impact it had because the first company I worked for, they just didn't believe in sales training. They said, it's okay, we've got product catalogs, we'll teach you on the product. <laughs> just go out, here's, here's all the stuff. You, and so I was out. It's okay, we've got product it. catalogs. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, you've got a product catalog, yes. Yeah. I mean, that, just go to the catalog, everything you need to know is in there. Phone your CSR person, uh, and they'll help you out with any questions. But, you know, it, and I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> when I first started, so it's... Uh, oh god it's uh, uh 28 years ago 28 28 or 29 years ago in sales and the first sales role i had the the company gave me a list of yellow pages and they said this is your territory mark out the customers build your own record cards work out your journey cycle and then i remember the sales director said to me just you know don't go from one town to the next don't go from cambridge to bedford if you're in cambridge stay in cambridge if you're in bedford stay in bedford <laughs> right so um that was my that's not bad advice it's not bad advice good yeah, off I, you go. <laughs> yeah just don't, don't waste too much petrol um but <laughs> and then and then i so i figured a lot of this stuff out myself it wasn't until you know, three years in and i by i guess a bit of luck and a bit of good judgment on my part i've managed to get to to a, an okay level but it, when i i moved into another company and and i was in about six months they said oh you need to go through our corporate sales training program and i went through the sales training program and it was it was like someone just was just turning on light bulbs for me i was like oh that's right so you could you can be intentional about that stuff I can manage that situation. I can handle that when someone says that. Right, that's what the way the approach you take. Oh, I should ask questions before I start to pitch. <laughs> ah, right, and, and it was it was just like somebody ju just pressed the reset button, and my my approach changed, the process changed, everything changed, and customer engagement heightened. Um, everything just became more consistent and deliverable. And I found myself kind of over and over again, being able to then just kind of reproduce the result. Like, oh, this is how it works. So I, it probably doubled my success rate. I used to, perhaps I could engage 30% of customers. I went to, you know, 60, 70% of customers after that. But it was just because I learned an approach that worked. Brilliant. And you still didn't waste any petrol. <laughs> I, well, I, the first I didn't have to drive any further <laughs> <laughs> because you were filling the day with good meaningful stuff and then repeating it mm -hmm. in the next place no I love yeah it. yeah and, but, it, but it was interesting because i think that, you know one of the reasons i wrote this book is because i worked with that system and then I, I, i've been through i'm sure you have as well lots of different sales trainings and and then decided actually you know there's always there's always something you change you know there's always yeah. there's always a <laughs> 
I like that bit, but I don't like this bit. I like this bit, but I don't like that. And so I ended up when I, you know, uh, three and a half, four years ago, when I set my business up, I retrained as a coach and, and actually had never, uh, hadn't really thought about sales model, sales training at that point. I, I'd sketched out a model in my, I'd sketched out the Inspire model in my, in my um, notebook back in about 2002, 2003 and parked it never ca- and then and then just kind of lifted it back out and said, actually, because I always wanted to design something that I felt would give me that consultative selling pro- process and approach and address, you know, mindset, skills and mm-hmm. psychology because I think, uh, sorry, mindset, skills and system. And I hadn't seen that in the market. So I, I always wanted to build something that was, kind of addressed all of the questions and challenges that I've faced as a salesperson, sales leader, business leader. Um, and, and actually, when I roll it out to organisation, it does seem to deliver on, on that promise, which is, you know, covers psychology first, then it looks, then we look at key skills, then we look at the structure that we know is going to deliver over and over again if you take a consultant approach. And that's why I liked it, because it's on the same same page as me in that yeah. well, there's lots of good stuff out there. Well, let's bring it in then. Mm-hmm. We, exactly. we kind of go agnostic. Yes, we you structure your model yourself, but actually the bit you're putting in, you need to pay, you know, pay, pay respect to where it's from. Yeah, you know, that's what this guy did, and it's brilliant. No, I'm not going to mm-hmm. change it. This bit, actually, the thinking's from here, but we're just going to tweak it a little bit. But exactly. how we've pulled it together, that's the, that's the unique element. You know? Yeah, yeah. Let's keep moving on. So you, you talked about change actually a couple of times in the last last minute or so. So, I mean, as salespeople, we're change agents. We sell change. Absolutely. So yeah, talk to me a little bit more just about sales and uh, sorry about about change and how a salesperson needs to approach that. Mm. Yeah. So there's lots of ways that that, that salespeople can do this. I mean, I I often think about um, to right the start of the Inspire model. The uh, the first I is insight, insight and impact, yeah. and when you think about where the customer is, very often as a customer, we think about ourselves in our own businesses, right? We get we get deep into our business, we get unintentionally blinkered, right? And one of the one of the foundations of value that as sales and business professionals we bring to people who are unintentionally blinking in their business is external insight, right? External insight. What's going on out in the marketplace? What are their competition doing what are your other customers doing what are you doing in your own business what are you learning and those insights if you can if you can bring them from you know a place of authenticity and credibility you bring them from uh, you know evidence-based uh, insights and information so it's not stuff you're making up in your business it's actually you know we're joining dots up here and we're bringing this as, as an approach to our customers when you bring that in the right manner, it disrupts the customer. It creates a driver for change, right? So if I'm a customer and I'm in my business working away and someone says to me, do you know the market's shifting? You know that in a year from now, it's going to be different and what you're doing could potentially be disrupted if you don't act before it. As a, as a customer, I might be a bit suspicious, first of all, right? I might be like, yeah, but you would say that, right? But if I'm then presented with evidence, if I then start to see some of, the, some of that disruption happening in other parts of either my business or, or the landscape, the market, and I start to join up the dots myself and the salesperson who's disrupted that and brought that information to me and said, look, here's how we think that change is going to play out and how you can benefit from it if you act early, then I start to become more open to change. And for, for me, you know, change is one of those, it, it's it's a constant, but it's also something that many of us resist, and I include myself in this. Sometimes I'm like, oh God, do we have to get, do we have to do something? Do we have to change again? <laughs> you know, but actually the art, the, the, I think for, for a lot of people, that initial response is oh, a little bit of resistance to it because we ju- you know, we just had this going. Now we've got to, now we've got to make a, you know, a new iteration or we've got to change or adapt. So for me, the best way to do that is an insight-led approach creates a disruption for the customer, gets them intrigued and interested in change. And that's the way that I approach it in my business is the way I've learned to approach it in the past. And it can be very, very effective if it comes from the right place and a place of authenticity for your customer. Yeah, no, agreed. It's, that's where a salesperson, I think, can really add value. 
that, that, that's what it is. If you focus too much, I, I believe, on like the value your product brings, the service you bring, you're missing the point. Yeah. yeah. Um, because if it's that obvious, then we don't even need you. But as the salesperson, if you're providing that that insight or just sparking that conversation, using those communication skills to get yeah. people to open their eyes to it, because you're doing it with good intent, and that could mean pushing the customer a little bit sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's got to be got to be tough with them. You're cruel to be kind, almost. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it makes it makes a real difference. I agree. I agree. And there's um, I learned this years ago, and then I saw it repeated in a couple of sales books. Uh, one of them was Where the Wolf by Jordan Belfort. But they talk about uh, when the customer is assessing, you know, a, a change or uh, a new solution or, or, or anything, really. They're assessing three things. They're assessing the company that's presenting the options that they uh, are being, that, that are, you know, in front of them. Right? The, so the company that's presenting the options, are they credible? Is it a brand I trust, like, no respect? Then they are also assessing the product. So if you know if you were look, you can use this with anything, right? But let's say you're looking at cars, right? So you're looking at cars. You think about the brand of the car, then you think about the model of the car, the product, right? And then the third thing you think about is the per the salesperson, the person who's going to provide you with the service or walk you through the service as you, as it's delivered to you. And I remember when I was buying, um, when I left the corporate world and I decided to buy myself a new car, not a new car, but a car. Um, I knew what car I wanted. I knew the brand I wanted. I researched that. So I knew the brand. And it was interesting. I went to three different showrooms. They all had the same car, but the, the, the final determining factor was the salesperson. Was what, you know, was that person going to deliver the right product? Would do, Did I trust them to, you know, deliver on the commitment that we were talking about? Did I like them? Did I warm to them? And on the first two occasions, the answer was no. And, I'm, and I actually didn't buy from that dealership because the salesperson wasn't, they hadn't taken any interest in me. They were just pitching and, uh, and trying to sell me things I didn't want. And I was like, you know, this actually isn't a very good experience. I'm walking. So it's, it's interesting. Even though I knew the, the brand, I knew the product. Actually, if the, if the person, if, as salespeople, we don't, if we don't see ourselves as part of the delivery of that package, the value we create, we can turn a customer off without even realizing it. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, that what you what you described there, I think is more common than we think mm. that the salesperson, I mean, the buying experience, if you like, and let's let's yeah. imagine the salesperson is a big, big part of that and they should be they should be driving that. That is the probably the only area that you can really differentiate now. Because a lot of companies, a lot of offers and things are just so, so similar that it's that way and that's exactly what you've described mm -hmm. is that way that you felt about well, actually this person is helping me or you know, bringing insights understanding that, that's, yeah. that's your differentiator yeah, yeah i agree yeah last up then the future orientation element which again you've been talking about all the way through you've, you've brought mm -hmm. all these elements together really really nicely but again just very specifically about this this orientation towards the future that a good salesperson would would bring to their approach yeah anything we should be aware of deliberately yeah i i think there's um there's a few things. So, so the, the first is definitely kind of knowing your market and knowing your market, knowing your business, uh, keeping an eye on future trends, understanding, you know, there's, there's that great sports saying, we come back to sports a few times in this discussion, you know, don't, don't look where the ball is now, look where the ball's going. You know, that's what the best sports people do. Then they're constantly ahead of the ball ahead of the game and that's what we have to think about in terms of sales and business we always have to start to think about what's the trend where would this market be going where might my customers be uh, evolving to in the future and how do i make sure i stay current and ahead of that and you can do that through you know researching key opinion leaders you can look at market research reports you can kind of start to dig deep into the topic there's something that i do uh, fred i don't know if you do this but i find it really useful I ha uh, have set up a series of Google alerts for key headings in my in, in the industries that I work in. And basically, a couple of times a week, Google will send me a Google alerts email with the title of the search term that I've set up as the alert. And it basically says from the last email to this email, here are the new Google search returns on that topic. So I don't have to go looking for uh, market insights they are coming to my inbox specifically from google alerts on a twice weekly basis so it's really it's, it's a really fascinating way to kind of keep yourself ahead of uh current you know trends 
and uh, and future direction of your own market. So you've got that as a as a kind of insight led approach for the market. I think the next piece then is is about ourselves and continually investing in ourselves. So one part of that is about you know the research you do, the reading you do, the personal and professional development. Uh, and another part of that is the podcast you listen to. Pod, podcasts you listen Sorry to, to exactly, you, mate. exactly. <laughs> You're on a blow. That's so rude. I said yeah. I wouldn't interrupt. No, no, it's good. The podcast. Well so <laughs> I, I think that I think that's bang on. The things you know, what, what do you do in your in your downtime to be able to keep ahead? And, and podcasts are one of the best. I think personally, one of the best examples. I've learned so much. I mean, I've referenced a couple of podcasts on here already today. Um, but there are some that are just, and, and I would include this uh, episode and your uh, whole series, obviously, Fred. Thank you. No, put about, it out now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, know about your subject, know about your market, know about your field, know about your specialty, your skills, and continually think about that investment in yourself. So it's what you, it's what you're listening to. But remember that it's not just about what you're listening to, reading, watching. It is about what you do with it. So it's about it's how you change what you do as a result of what you learn. Uh, and then the, the other piece that you and I have talked about, Fred, is, is about um, who you surround yourself with. So getting, getting among people who are high performers, who see themselves as high performers, who normalize high performance. And that changes the expectation that you have of yourself. You start to become a future thinker when you surround yourself with people who are by default future thinkers. So you've got this continual elevation of your performance, continual elevation of the expectation of what you should be delivering. You, you do have to, 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 I guess, think about how you measure that because sometimes that can create a bit of pressure that if you don't harness that in the right way, it can kind of tip over into stress. And we talked about this one-to-one, uh, -one, Fred, ourselves. So you do have to think about, yeah, I, I see myself as a high performer. I want to be surrounded by, you know, a cohort or, you know, a community of higher performing salespeople. And both you and I have communities like that. Then that starts to get you thinking differently. It does start to challenge your own perceptions and expectations of yourself. That's a good thing, but you do need to make sure that you balance that with recognizing how far you've come, celebrating your successes, giving yourself the personal recognition that you need so that you don't just become, you know, uh, subject to stress and, uh, and this need to continually improve, which is a good thing when it's, when it's balanced. Um, and then the final piece of me, Fred, that model, my Inspire model, the second, the, the, sorry, the last step, which are two letters, the RE, are a reflection. And I, that's a deliberate final stage of my sales process because that is the link to continued, continual self-improvement. And I look at that as a self-coaching kind of step. So as a salesperson, at the end of every cycle, every key customer meeting, every time when we have, you know, a really either, either a good or a, or a poor performing um, sales visit, sales call with a customer, always take the time to reflect on it. Just think about Okay, how did that go? What went well? What did I learn? What should I change next time? And start to really lean into this personal evolution and growth. And I, one of the things that I do that I, I find incredibly valuable, at half past four every Friday, I have a meeting with myself. It's half an hour. And I reflect on my week. And I just build in that half an hour window. It does a couple of things for me. It helps me reflect and capture key kind of insights from the week and changes that I want to make going forward. Second thing it does, it helps me tie, tie a loop around my week and kind of go, right, that is the end of the week. Mm. Kind of going into the weekend now and, and some incredible nuggets because I don't do anything else in that half an hour. I've got uh, three key questions to ask myself. Uh, and in those, in that meeting with myself, that helps me just to wrap up segue into my Friday evening and the weekend but it also is I find it quite cathartic in terms of the discussion with myself it sounds uh yeah it, it, it can, sometimes it's quite a deep discussion actually on a Friday afternoon it goes beyond the half an hour but it, I always find it back yeah no no I, well I do it daily mm. I, I, I wise that up I use Rocky to to ask me uh, questions yes yeah so yeah. again it's, it's you're probably going in a deeper whole week I'm just reflecting on the day I think I do it in the morning 
Where's this day going? Okay, thanks. Answer little questions. Is this robot? <laughs> People think I'm weird, but it worked because really I'm answering myself, aren't I? Yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. Self coaching. End of the yeah. day, what's happening? So it's you know I'm not even self coaching. Too lazy for it. <laughs> not good enough at it, perhaps. No, but th- that's getting me to do that. So no, I, I think the reflection piece is is really really important and mm-hmm. keeping learning from what it is you're doing in real life with real customers. Yeah. That is what drives, you know, you talk about future re- yeah. direction. That's what yeah. drives the future direction, that continual learning. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. This has been excellent. You've shared mm, so much you. good stuff. Show so much good stuff. How can people get in touch with you? Because I know that, you know, you do like to share anyway. So there's lots of other yeah. good stuff available. So how can they, how can they get in touch? There, there are lots of ways that people can get in touch with me. Um, the, the easiest probably is uh, through Linktree. So if, uh, if, you, if you go onto Linktree and then forward slash Justin Lee, uh, L-E-I-G-H, and uh, once you've got that Linktree account up, you can contact me through every mechanism. So my email's on there, programs are on there, all my social uh, media accounts. Uh, so, so that's probably the quickest and easiest way. So connect with me. I, I love uh, new connections. So I'm on most of the main channels, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, I've got a YouTube channel where there's lots of free content. If you're interested in that, uh, I'm on Twitter. So uh, yeah, all, I'm on the four main platforms. Probably my go-to is LinkedIn uh, from yeah. the B2B stuff, B2B perspective. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll pop that into we'll pop the, the link tree into the um, great into, into show notes. Yeah, I'm giggling because I, I do the same. Yeah, it's like yeah. TikTok. Yeah, I, I have got <laughs> a TikTok account, but I've not been on it for a while. Don't don't look at TikTok. I've got it to point to the others just to the, to grab the domain. But yeah, no. Yeah. Look, Justin, that is, it's so cool. Really, really kind of you to spend, spend the time and talk through this stuff. It's been, I, I've made loads of notes. You know, I, I, I'd like to try and work out what I'm going to call the episode and then put a couple of like three, three minute bullet points. Yeah, I'm exactly. struggling. I'm struggling a bit. <laughs> 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 or I might just go back to, um, I might just go back to what you said the model is. Oh, it's fine. Mindset, yeah. mindset skill system. Bag. There we go. Done. Yeah. Those are three yeah. points. I'm not even going to write any more words. Just listen to it because there's, there's so much other good stuff. But uh, no, thanks for really it. kind, mate. Thank you so much for, for the pleasure. time. And uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Fred. Take care. Cheers.